When people think about the country of Finland, they may think of the cold, the snow and the incredibly dark winters. But what about the summers? Where the winters are dark in Finland, the summers are light, with even the most southern cities and villages in the country getting about 20 hours of sunlight a day during the summer. And it was just on one of these long summer days in 1960 that four teenagers set out on a camping trip. The destination was the lakeside of Lake Bodom, a peaceful and popular camping site near the city of Espo. The teenagers travelled light, only bringing one tent to share between the four of them, but they didn't seem to mind, as the group was rather close and tight-knit. Myla Irmali Bjorklund and Anya Tuliki Maki were just 15 years old, and with them were Niels Wilhelm Gustafsson and Seppo Antero Boisman, both of them 18 years old and the girls' boyfriends. Niels was with Myla and Seppo with Anya, and for all anyone knew from the outside looking in, the couples seemed to get on well with both each other and with the others in the group. They must have been incredibly excited when they set out that summer day, and they set up camp right along the shore of the lake. However, this happiness was short-lived. Early on the Sunday morning, about 6am, and just after the teenagers had set up camp, a group of boys out birdwatching along the lake spotted a blonde man walking away from what looked to be a pile of fabric, or maybe even just a tent that had collapsed. The man didn't seem to be upset or injured, so the boys thought he was out doing the same thing that they were, just enjoying the beautiful scenery. But only a few hours later, a nationwide hunt would be launched to find the blonde man off the shore of Lake Bottom. Around 11am that morning, a carpenter named Esko Oiva Johansson also spotted the pile of fabric off the shore of the lake, only he decided to take a closer look than the birdwatchers. Esko made his way down to the lake shore, probably already noticing that something was wrong before he'd even got close to the pile of fabric. It didn't take him long to figure out what he was looking at, as it was the remains of a tent, tattered and ripped and soaked with blood. Lying on top of the tent, he could see a young girl, naked from the waist down and stabbed to death. Esko left the tent, making a beeline to somewhere with a phone so that he could alert the authorities, and before anyone knew it, most of the police in the neighbouring city of Espo had descended on the scene of what looked like a quadruple murder. Inside the tent, they found Seppo and Anya. Both had been bludgeoned with a large, blunt object and then stabbed multiple times. Going off of the positions of the wounds and the ripped fabric of the tent, the investigators determined that the killer had actually attacked them from outside of the tent, hitting and stabbing them blindly until they'd cut away enough of the fabric to see what they were aiming at or whether their victims had perished. On the top of the tent was Myla. She was the only one that had been stripped and the only one of the victims who appeared to have been stabbed after she died, and that got the investigators thinking. Had Myla been the target? The investigators were left wondering, but it wasn't long before they caught a break in the case and discovered something that would bring hope to the investigation. Hidden half in and half out of the tent was Niels. He'd been bludgeoned and stabbed, but was missing his shoes, and he was actually alive. Niels was rushed to a hospital where he was treated for his wounds. He'd been hit in the face with something and his jaw had been broken, but the investigators could hardly wait for him to wake up to see if he could tell them who had done this to him and murdered his friends. And when Niels did finally wake up, he had a lot to say. He explained that sometime during 4am and 6am that Sunday morning, he wasn't exactly sure when, but somebody had attacked them. He couldn't remember much about the attack, but what Niels could remember about their attacker is that he'd been a man dressed in black. Niels said that one of the last things he could remember was the attacker's red eyes coming for them. The authorities were then on the lookout for a man. If the bird watchers had actually managed to spot him, then they knew that they were looking for a blonde man, but that didn't really help them narrow down the list of suspects. 
The investigators went back to the scene, searching for more clues and answers, but almost from the very first step, the police had made a huge mistake. In a rush to get to the tent, the arriving officers hadn't blocked off the crime scene, and with reinforcements constantly coming in to try and help with the investigation, precious physical evidence was lost or tampered with. This didn't stop the police at the scene from trying to find something new though, and they had more than a few things that they were actually looking for. The murder weapons were two of them. It was clear that the killer had used a knife, but the investigators weren't sure what the blunt object had been. They theorised that it also could have been a rock, so teams set out around the lake searching for the murder weapons or sign of any other disturbances in the area. But they were also on the lookout for things that had gone missing from the tent itself. Several items, including Neil's shoes and the keys to both his and Seppo's motorcycles, had been stolen, and the investigators worried that the killer had used them to get away from the scene of the murders. But that wasn't quite right either. Only the keys were missing. The killer had left the motorcycles behind, and then one of the teams of investigators stumbled upon Niels' shoes. They had been left about 500 metres away from the tent, partially hidden between some rocks and foliage and covered in blood. It didn't look like the killer had left anything else behind. No one could even say why he'd taken the shoes and left them where he did either, but it was clear that the situation was starting to get out of hand. The police who discovered the boots didn't cordon off this site either, leading to further losses and tampering of evidence, only by this time other people had started to notice. The police department were widely and harshly criticised in the press, with them calling them out for the mistakes that the investigation had made so far, and that put more pressure on the department to find the elusive blonde man with red eyes. They settled on a suspect, Carl Valdemar Gullström, otherwise known as the Kiosk Man, because he owned and ran a kiosk near the campsite, but Carl was very rarely called the Kiosk Man fondly. He had a terrible reputation and was known to harass hikers and campers. For years, locals had seen him scream and shout at people around the lake, but it was probably more what he was known to do to the campers that had the investigators looking at him a bit closer. According to witness reports, Carl would sometimes throw rocks and cut down people's tents to try and get them to leave the campsite, and that was a few similarities too many for the investigators to just brush him off as a suspect in this case. There were later reports by witnesses who claimed to have seen Carl leaving the scene of the crime and that they had only not come forward sooner because they had been afraid of Carl, but the police got little out of him when they brought him in for questioning. He was let go and later confessions he made, both when he'd been drunk and sober, it seemed to contain very specific details about the murders that weren't taken very seriously by the police. For whatever reason, Carl was ruled out as a suspect. There were more suspects, one of them supposedly a former KGB agent, and there were more rumours and speculation over who the killer could actually be, but there were no more arrests. That was until about 44 years after the murder when the authorities arrested someone whose name was already very closely tied to this case. They arrested and charged Niels Wilhelm Gustafsson for the murder of his friends and his girlfriend, Myla. The arrest stunned the public, but the prosecution came out to say that Niels had been a suspect in the case from the very beginning. It went back to the evidence surrounding his shoes. Advances in DNA technology had made it easier for the investigators to pinpoint exactly whose blood had been on Niels' shoes, and the answer was quite surprising. Myla, Seppo and Anya's blood had all been on Niels' shoes, but Niels hadn't. If the killer really had attacked all four of them at the same time, then that would mean that the shoes would most likely have samples of all of their blood on it. This piece of evidence became even more important when the prosecution claimed that prints in the victim's blood that had been left inside the tent matched the size and pattern of the prints on the soles of Niels' shoes. However, Niels had also been attacked. He'd been stabbed and the blow to his face had left him with a broken jaw before he'd been left for dead along with the others. It looked like it had only been a stroke of luck that he hadn't died with his friends. But the prosecution argued that this had all been part of the plan. They put a narrative before the courts and one that played out quite differently to the way that Niels had claimed the night gone. They said Niels had gotten drunk 
too drunk and that he had made the others who'd have to share a tent with him that night uncomfortable. They said he had probably gotten a bit rowdy, maybe even a bit aggressive, and things had come to blows when Seppo had tried to talk to him. The boys had fought, a fight that had left Niels with a broken jaw, and he was officially kicked out of the tent. Now stuck on his own, in pain and still drunk, there'd be nothing else for Niels to do than to think about getting payback. He'd attacked the others, killing Seppo and Anya before he'd taken things a step further with Myla. That's why Myla had been the only one who'd been stripped and the only one who'd been stabbed after she'd died. Everything pointed back to Niels, but he'd done everything he could try to cover his tracks afterwards. He'd left his boots away from the scene, just like he'd taken and hidden other items just to throw the investigators off his scent, and then he'd stabbed himself, making it look like he'd been attacked at the same time as the others. It was certainly an interesting theory, possibly even the truth, but one of the few concrete truths about this case is that the investigators botched the investigation. Almost no physical evidence could be tied to Niels without the benefit of the doubt because the investigators hadn't secured the crime scene properly, and that was exactly what Niels' defence argued. They also argued that Niels wouldn't have physically been able to attack the others given the state of his injuries, and the court agreed. All charges against Niels were dropped, and the state was ordered to pay him €44,900 for the mental suffering he'd gone through while he'd been incarcerated for his charges. No other suspects have been named, and nobody has come forward claiming to be the one responsible for one of Finland's most brutal murders and its longest unsolved crime. <laughs>